uh hi everyone i'm kunal great to meet you all and virtually i'm based out of seattle and today i'm going to talk about uh product product led growth a new and upcoming concept in consumer tech products and i'm a data scientist for adobe and uh like mentioned already uh i won't go too deep into this but i did my masters in computational data science from carnegie mellon and uh um i did my internship at adobe as well and there's a blog about my work in case you're interested and i have been contributing a lot to ai for social good in uh so some of the projects have been featured by bbc harvard npr government of india and other news outlets and i have been a two time tedx tedx speaker as well talking about how ai can be used for social good and for solving problems faced by citizens all over the world uh so let's start so i'm going to talk about two main things in this talk product data science and product led growth in product data science i'm mainly interested in talking about how the job description of a data scientist is changing data scientist has become a pretty generic and popular term and can refer to you know almost four to five different roles um one can be a data scientist who does just dashboarding one can be a data scientist who does product analytics one can be a data scientist who does growth marketing so and this role has changed over time so i want to spend some time on that before diving into product led growth and what is this new concept which has evolved and uh, is happening or as in is the buzzword in recent new upcoming companies so to begin i also had a tiring job search just like everyone else when transitioning from academia to industry um when uh, while i was completing my masters and planning to apply for jobs and from the beginning i knew that i wanted to be a data scientist but i slowly realized the changing description and the changing roles and responsibilities of a data scientist five years before versus now and want to elaborate on that because all of us are looking and are continuously looking to upskill ourselves so some observations which i noticed and how that helped me in shaping up my career so far in the industry um you know as you are aware the most generic job description of a data scientist is that they need to be proficient in sql they need to be proficient in data visualization responsible for calculating product health you know performing executive reporting summaries dashboarding and all of this is uh you know i would say the, it was almost 100% of all the job descriptions 5 years back and similarly now with the rise in uh, large language models deep learning concepts as you all are aware there's a new uh, job role which many of the research folks do which is called as applied scientist in which they need to be proficient in machine learning deep learning responsible for iterating new features ml algorithms or like the previous speaker they need to know about deep fake creating those videos or understanding the bias in those videos so these are two distinct job roles which have been created you know 5 6 years back and one thing which i realize is that in the recent times the boundaries between between these two roles are gradually becoming shorter and shorter and up getting quite blurry mainly because the role of product data scientist is evolving a lot because of more metrics being tracked by companies more experiments performed to attract new users there has been a significant rise of data driven startups all around and it has become a highly competitive tech environment you are seeing the rise of all the new uh, tech innovations and ai innovations out there and due to the emergence of product led growth and how that has transformed how product companies are operating and how they are thinking about creating these new products <clears throat> and one thing which i realized is that after going into industry and you know preparing for all the job interviews giving those job interviews having you know first hand experience of working in the industry as well as in the research field that the goal of product data scientist is to maintain product health collaborate with pms on data analysis automating okrs and kpis and that is fine that is something which is a given but product data scientists can still do more they can incorporate state of the art data science techniques for deep product analysis and growth experiments and this is something which has uh you know developed over the last one or two years in which you know product data scientists are expected to conduct ab tests do some plg analysis 
and assist the research teams in driving more data-driven features. While initially they were just restricted to doing dashboarding, tooling, calculating the metrics. And all that is due to the fact that there has been a new emergence of the concept product-led growth. And so uh, I want to talk about what it is. I'll give a few examples of that and showcase how that works. And in case you are looking to incorporate product-led growth in your new product or your new company, what are some of the things you should be aware about? So product-led growth or PLG, as it is called, is a new and upcoming business model followed by most major startups. I think it was created by a few startups only and now it is being incorporated in all companies, no matter how big or small you are. And it is a product-driven way to drive user retention, growth, conversion, marketing through amazing user experiences. And so to give you an example, what used to happen for so many years is that each of these teams, which are highlighted in blue circles, like the feature development or the engineering team, the sales or marketing team, the retention team, the design team, you know, any other uh, data science team, all of them, so many years had individual teams were working in silos. They had the individual metrics to track, uh, to track and there was very limited coordination and cooperation between all these four teams because you know, feature development team was just focused on, let's say, building new features and optimizing the product. You know, sales and marketing was only focused on driving new campaigns or sending email alerts. You know, design team is focused on just designing new features. So all of them tracked their own team goals. And this led to a lot of isolated development. And, but this was the, you know, this was the methodology which all product teams were following for so many for the last 10 to 15 years and what were some of the drawbacks of this process and like i mentioned it was isolated in terms of teams and goals there was a lack of communication and a shared product vision across teams and then it becomes difficult to expand to new markets users and territories uh, given that everyone is operating in such isolated environment and this gave light uh, this gave rise to the concept of product led growth in which all the teams which I talked about, design, engineering, sales, marketing, data science, all of them are working towards the shared vision of driving rich user experiences by making changes in the product itself. So they all now have a shared goal, vision, you know, objective and key result to track and measure themselves by uh, uh, at the end of the year. So they, they no longer op uh, operate isolated in an isolated way. All of these teams come together to, you know, build a product which can attract new users. And one thing which I want to focus on is product led growth is mainly important when you want to grow the product and attract new users, you know, at a fast paced uh, rate. So basically, if you want to scale your product quickly, the best way to do that is by doing product led growth. So what are the three pillars of product-led growth? The first is the user-centered design in which there's the biggest focus is on providing the best end user experience and understanding what our customers do and how we can personalize their journey becomes super vital. Uh, the second pillar is delivering initial value. Essentially, it's very essential to deliver initial value of the product before asking for payment. And this takes place through freemium models delayed paywalls or self-serve free trials and focus is on maximizing the conversion rate. And uh, a very good example, which I think of in delivering initial value is that I believe every one of you would have uh, had this experience in your childhood that when you go to some ice cream parlor, you can ask for a few free samples and they can give you, you know, one or two spoonfuls of different flavors of ice cream before you can and you don't need to pay anything for that and then once you like your flavor you you know you have to uh tell your parents that okay i want this particular flavor of ice cream and in some way they all the ice cream parlor is also doing the same thing they are delivering you initial value for free of cost by giving you few flavors to try out try out for and basically they get 
the end consumer addicted to few of the flavors. If I like the chocolate chip flavor, I'll end up buying that. And in the end, for a very small one spoonful of free product, the ice cream parlor is earning like 100 or 200 rupees or like five to ten dollars um, just by opening that avenue of exploring uh, free trials. So that is the perfect example, which I think everyone has had in their childhood. And the third is the data led product insights. And this is where the role of data scientists now becomes super crucial that because high velocity of AB testing is required to continuously iterate and improve user experiences. And this is due to uh, the fact that product sales, marketing experience are done within the product. So data scientists have the responsibility to, under uh, to understand which of the experiences is delivering value to the end user and which of the experiences are actually, you know, pretty bad for the end user and we shouldn't do that. So these are the main three pillars of data led product insights. And how do these pillars help? I believe uh, by now all of you would have had experience with, you know, any app, which any popular app, which you take, for example, um, they have some initial free trial. It can be free trial in number of days. It can be free trial in number of uh, amount of storage you can use before you need to pay. And so what happens is that when you sign up for that particular app and activate the free trial, you are now in the activation phase. And once you start using the app, let's say in the free trial period, which might be one week, and then you realize that, oh, this app is actually quite cool. And this is, uh, you know, helping me in getting so many of my tasks done or helping me in my social content. And then you observe the first benefits of that particular product uh, in, and you turn into engagement. And finally, at the end of the free trial, then you have a decision to make in which whether do you want to pay to get the entire full version or what do you want to give up? But by that time you have already observed or that's the hope that you have already observed the benefits of the product and hence you'll end up buying it and develop a habit of using that product. And then once you end up buying it, the next phase comes in that how to ensure that you are engaged and how to ensure that you are retained year over year. So, you know, I gave the example of an ice cream parlor. It comes up in the, all the three that initially you just visit an ice cream parlor and you become, become activated in it. Then they give you free samples to try out for and you become addicted to it. You like one or two flavors and then you end up buying the entire uh, ice cream tub and then you tell your parents to come again next week and come again. You bring your friends to that particular ice cream parlor. You bring your family to that particular ice cream parlor. And this is exactly what is happening in the uh, new age products out there that they give you a small trial and then they ensure that you bring your community to that particular product and most of us end up paying for that particular service. <clears throat> and so this is like the modern PLG factory in which you have product managers, designers, engineering, product marketing, data scientists, in which data scientists is like completing the loop and giving guidance in what data is mattering the most for the end user. And looking close, uh, looking more closely at the data science links. One link is that, you know, measuring the health of the product, analyzing the experiment results, tracking KPIs, OKRs, product metrics, you know, business executive reporting, creating summary reports for other teams. And data scientists do this quite well because they have been doing this since many years now. And this is something which they already know uh, and they're pretty good at. But this particular link is where data scientists can do much better in using advanced ML algorithms to derive product insights, you know, building predictive data-driven features with PMs and cross-domain AI techniques for product research. And they can do this a lot more better than what we are currently doing because this is the need of the R when we want to drive PLG using data science. And like any new process, there are some challenges with PLG. One being the major one being is that every action button click in the product needs to be recorded and instrumented. And this results in huge quantities of data gathered from the product. And so you need a pretty good data engineering backend, which is fast, which is scalable to support all these different 
data streams coming in so that we can analyze and provide different experiences. So with PLG, the biggest focus becomes data uh, and everything, each and every click, each and every step, uh, step the user takes gets recorded. And starting PLG motions in an old product requires a big data technology and system overhaul um, in some cases. And so that's why I think when you are building a new product, it is it becomes a lot more easy compared to trying to incorporate PLG in an old product. You can definitely do that. But in case you want to build a new product, then building PLG right from the start becomes slightly easier because then you can think about at that time itself, how to, you know, scale the data and how to ensure that all the data is, uh, gets recorded. And finally, a few takeaways from the talk that for PLG data science is important for research, reporting and communication and an end to end experiment cycle is required. Successful PLG roadmaps require both data science discovery and metrics tracking and reporting. So it's like an end to end framework again. And the role of product data scientist has evolved and will continue to evolve as more and more companies adopt PLG frameworks for growth. So that is something to keep in mind for, especially for budding data scientists who want to get into the industry or want to work at some of the exciting startups or exciting tech companies that uh, this role is evolving as more uh, as there's a lot more focus on data now compared to last compared to five years ago. So, uh, you know, this will continue to evolve and uh, we can make ourselves more skilled by understanding what these PLG frameworks are and the technical concepts behind them. And with that, I would like to uh, end my talk. Thank you so much for this opportunity. And yeah, I'm open.